driving back or forth on Saturdays uh, on you know all the the uh, Big 12 stations. I like to listen to all of our voices in the Big 12, and certainly a, a, a very good one is Tony Caridi of the Mountaineer Radio Network joins us now. Um, Tony, how are you? Robert, good afternoon. Thank you for the very kind words. I was listening just a few seconds ago. Are you running a sports book there? What are you doing? Some over-unders, in-game props? What are we doing there? <laughs> now, you know, uh, the listeners love a contest. And I've, yeah. for years I've been trying to come up with a hard contest. I want it to be, you know, hard. Last week, for the <laughs> first time I can remember, we did a contest. We had a number of people that sent their picks in, and we didn't have a winner. And it was uh, – I just did high low on five different categories in right. the uh, in the Tulsa game. Now, let's be honest, and I don't know if you tuned in and watched, but I, I know I know Jed did because we talked to him the other day. I don't think anybody really thought Oklahoma State and Tulsa were going to go to the fourth quarter uh, with Tulsa leading seven to three. <laughs> Neither no. did any of my listeners. So most of the high lows, most most of the picks they had that were high ended up low for the day. And the one thing, this is great, because last year there was more frustration with the Aussie punter, Tom Hutton, because right. I think his overall punting average was 39-something. But he only gave up a total of 18 return yards all year. I mean, he's not, he's not a boomer, but he can directionally kick, and he can kick it so guys can't really return it. And uh, so I had one of the deals was high-low 40-yard average on Hutton punting. Everybody picked low, and he went high. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> what does one What does one win if they win your contest? Uh, I've got uh, my man Garrett over at the end zone with uh, he's he's got all the Nike T shirts, the ones the players wear, and the coaches. So uh, he, we give away a, a Nike OSU team issue shirt every week. I like to it. a winner. I yeah, like it. I'm a, so. I, I'd like to do something like that, too. I want to talk to you about that. I want to find out how people enter, how you're doing all that part of it. I'd like to do that as well. They do it. We have a uh, – I get many more people during the show that respond to the show via text. We call them triple yeah. play texters. We have a number, and they get a number. And, you know, we've got like 800 or so of them. And, you know, um, and so most of them send their picks in on that. And then I, I get the lovely task on Sunday of going through and, Oh, man. out if anybody anybody hit it I, i'd like to get an intern to do that yes <laughs> that's what i need yes, exactly. um, hey you had a, you guys had a fun time i i did tune in and watch uh in fact it was terrible because all three of the big 12 games i wanted to watch that day that i thought would be really competitive were on at 11 a.m Two of them were more competitive than anybody thought one of them which i didn't think was going to be competitive was yours and so I ended up watching less of that, and more of Iowa State and K State, because they were, they were embroiled in in some pretty interesting yeah. battles. But you guys had a lot of fun with Eastern Kentucky. Yeah, they're a program that is in the midst of a massive rebuild. They had a coaching change in the off season. They dealt a lot with COVID in the off season, and I think that impacted them uh, all the way around. So it wasn't a good scenario for them. They're in a really weird situation, Robert, in that their league is not playing this fall but they opted to play in the fall and become an independent so they're they're jumbled around so it was exactly what west virginia needed uh, to be quite honest with you not to degrade eastern kentucky because they're in the process of you know rebuilding and they're at a different level to begin with Uh, but it was exactly what west virginia needed in in this uh, really weird season that we're all in they needed to play someone else Um, they needed to get a good feel about themselves where do they stand uh, before they head into uh, Stillwater this weekend you know uh, when I look at it though and and I had said this to several people in fact I said it on the show back when Oklahoma State was due to play West Virginia in November I said that's not good folks because when you get to November I really think West Virginia is going to be uh, a team to ta- you know that you don't want to tangle with. I-, I have a lot of respect for Neil Brown. I think he's a dynamite coach, and um, and honestly, I'm afraid West Virginia may be ahead of schedule. I think this is going to be a a very difficult game uh, for Oklahoma State on Saturday. I think both both teams are. This will be a battle. I think we're going to have a a contest on our hands Saturday, Tony. Well, I hope so. I hope it's from our perspective. We certainly hope 
uh, that West Virginia goes in there and competes. So it was a good game last year in Morgantown, as you well know, Robert. It came down oh, yeah. in the fourth quarter. Cowboys scored um, 10 unanswered and, and won the game. You were in a situation there where you did not have your starting quarterback, and obviously you're in that same potential predicament um, this weekend. So um, I think West Virginia is very much looking forward to it. Uh, it's amazing how many defenders that you guys uh, returned from last season's team and putting my charts together. Uh, man, a lot of recognizable names, and obviously in your skill spots offensively, um, from Wallace to Hubbard to Stoner to you go to Jelani Woods. I mean, those are all names that I've come to <laughs> I've come to know over the last several years, and they're all back. So um, it's got the it's got the makings, but I do think this as well. Because of the unstable nature of the season and of the preparation that everyone has had, and obviously, you know, dealing with COVID somewhat on a, on a regular basis, who doesn't practice, who hasn't practiced, when did the teams come together, how's your chemistry, how's your leadership, how off is that from what the norm is, um, I think that every single weekend in college football, um, more so than the regular, we're going to get uh, unexpected results. No, I, I agree with you totally, and um, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, a couple of things with, with West Virginia. I, I look at uh, the, the skill players, you know, the you know Simmons and, and Sean Ryan and, and some of these guys I've seen before, and then also I thought last year in that game in Morgantown, I thought, you know, in fact, I told Dave and John this after the game, I said they found their quarterback. Yeah, you know, Deggy threw. I know West Virginia didn't score a lot of points that day, but he threw for over 300. Yeah. He was he was spot on. And uh, again, I know uh, he's just now really kind of getting his feet wet for West Virginia. But this kid's played a lot of football. I, I think you guys are going to have a lot of fun with him. And plus, he knows Neil's system. Yeah, it's a good point, and you're right. Um, it's going to be fun to watch him develop. For those that don't know, played 17 games at Bowling Green, transferred, became immediately eligible last season, and then played in the final four games for West Virginia, starting the last three. West Virginia won at K-State and one at TCU at the end of the season. The really super weird thing about this, Robert, and I think your listeners will kind of shake your head and it kind of underscores where we are right now with the, with the craziness. So he played four games last year to maintain a red shirt, right? So those don't count. Mm -hmm. He could conceivably play 10 games this year, and they don't count. So Deggie's eligibility clock may not start until after he plays 14 games at West Virginia. Yeah, Crazy. And, and yeah, and the hope is, uh, if it was funny because I interviewed Dylan Stoner yesterday, and Stoner already got an injury year from the NCAA. He's been around a while. He's going to have his master's. In fact, I think he may be close to having it already. I asked him yesterday, I said, you know, your clock stops this year. You could come back one more year next year and get a doctorate. And he laughed. He goes, no, this is it. This is, this is all from college. I'm done. This is the last yeah. round. You know, but it, it, it is amazing. And, and gosh, if you could keep – uh, Deggy for you know get him another year. That's that's a tremendous bonus. I don't think you're going to be able to keep uh, Darius Stills another year. I think he's no. got uh, a reservation at uh, on Sundays coming up. Yeah, he's uh, he's got a chance. Uh, he's uh, obviously um, West Virginia's best defensive player as far as the down linemen go. Um, interesting story. He grew up. 20 minutes away from Morgantown, his dad played uh, at West Virginia and then played in the NFL for a long time and was with the Kansas City Chiefs. And so we just kind of refer to those brothers as the Stills brothers, right? Uh, there's yes. Dante and there's Darius. Darius was the preseason Big 12 player of the year. And, you know, ever since that came out, Neil Brown has said, that's great. You know, it's a great honor. Now you have to prove that it's true. And I think um, that's that's always the thing, as you well know. You become a marked man now, so I, I don't think Darius Stills is going to get one snap this season where it's just going to be a single blocker blocking him. Right? You're going to get you're going to get pounded, and so how does he deal with that? And how, what kind of a year can he have? Uh, it'll it'll be fun to watch him develop. The size is a natural comparison, but do you? Do you see him as like an Aaron Donald type athletic guy in the middle of the, the defensive front like that? Boy, I tell you what, Robert. When you mentioned Robert, when you mentioned Donald, holy heck! I mean, I think we're dealing something with there that that we've never seen before. Here's the interesting. This will this will stun you, man. Here's the interesting story about Darius Stills. When he was coming out, his brother Dante, who is younger, 
was the right. much more highly recruited, recruited and highly yeah. regarded player. And the general thought was that they only offered Darius Stills in order to get Dante. And there were people, and this staff is no longer here, but there were people on staff at West Virginia that said, don't think he's a player, probably should play. There's a school in his hometown, Fairmont State, which is Division Fairmont II. Fairmont State, yeah, I'm aware yeah. So he said, they said, probably more of a Fairmont State player. He had one offer, um, and that was Rutgers. And Rutgers, he verbaled to Rutgers. As soon as he verbaled to Rutgers, West Virginia went like, whoa, we got to jump in here and get this kid in order to keep in play to get his brother Dante. Well, the deal is, man, that Darius came in and had that massive chip on his shoulder and has been really proving anyone that criticized or questioned his ability. Um, he really had a blossom type of a season last year. And as I said a moment ago, the question is, now can you do it again when everyone knows who you are. That, that'll be the point with him. Yeah. And here's the thing, and I, I mentioned this with Jed the other day. In fact, I asked Neil about it yesterday because it fascinates me. I'm, I'm more of a defensive guy, so I, I hated the fact OSU's defensive effort got lost in some of the offensive struggles and adversity that were faced yeah. last week in the opener against Tulsa. But seeing what they're what Neil's doing, and I know I'm, I'm, I know Vic Coning well. He's an Oklahoma native, and I've known him, you know, for a long time. Good good football coach, and I like his defensive philosophies. And now you've got Coach Leslie that's coaching the front. I know he's done a lot of junior. He was a, a DC in the junior college ranks, including down in Kilgore, down in Texas. And then you've got Coach Adai, who's a, a former Mountaineer player that's handling the back end. And I'm fascinated that you've got two guys that are – their minds are having to work together. And against tempo, which OSU will go tempo, this will be – I mean, to me, it's 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 really fun to see two coaches have to work this way and, and that they can accomplish it. Yeah, I, I think the reality of it is this. I, I Obviously, Robert, it's being possible if they were simultaneously making calls in a game. I right. think – I think all week they work. Okay, what are we going to do here? As you well know, what are we going to do here? What do we got here? And I think that it's probably Leslie that's ultimately saying calling in the play. And again, right. we've had to go just go through one game, but it is interesting and it's it's unique because West Virginia and Vic Coning separated relatively late in the off season, and rather than naming a DC and just saying that's it, Neil is going to go with this route. You got a lot of experience in that room. Jeff Castile, who was West Virginia's defensive coordinator during uh, the Rich Rodriguez era and the Bill Stewart era, um, is in that room as well because he was elevated from analyst to position coach when Vic left. And so you've got his wealth of experience. Dante Wright was the D was a D coordinator. He came over from the Mid American Conference, and and obviously, as you mentioned, Leslie's got D coordination experience, and Jamile has been around a lot. So. Well schooled, wired in there, but the question was going into the first game: How does it work? How do you communicate? Well, so far so good. But as you said, uh, if the Cowboys and obviously the rest of the league starts to heat it up, and you're changing on the fly, that'll be the ultimate test. Well, and the interesting thing too is uh, it could be Coach Castillo, who's the eyes upstairs, that may have more to do with what gets called than either of the guys down on the floor. Because you and I both know, it's like on Saturday, you know, Dave and John have a much better view than sure. I do. And just like you and Dwight have a much better view than what Jed's seeing. Because, you know, a lot of things I don't see until I watch them on Sunday. Right. So, exactly. Absolutely true. But, well, uh, again, and, and here's the last thing I wanted to ask you. And it, it doesn't have anything to do with the team. It has to do with the, the broadcasters. Uh, we're fortunate. All of our trips this year are, you know, close in texas and we got the two kansas schools on the road certainly we know you guys have a much tougher travel chore than 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 we do every year how are you guys traveling i mean i, I just hope uh, it, it's going to work out for you guys with with the covid 19 i know teams are slimming up their their travel rosters because they're spacing out so are are you guys able to go with the team Right, so we have reduced the size of our crew, or we're going to try right. it for the very first time Saturday. 
It'll be myself and Jed Drenning, who's our sideline reporter and our radio engineer. And we normally travel three other guys, uh, Dan Zangrilli, Dale Wolfley, who do pregame halftime and post, and uh, Dwight Wallace, who's our color right. analyst. So what we're going to try to do, cross my fingers, cross my toes, is that Dwight and Dan and Dale will be in Morgantown in our press box booth, in our in our booth at home. They'll be watching the game on a feed, um, which does not have or supposedly doesn't have um, latency or delay of the video signal. And we're going to try as best as we can to incorporate Coach Wallace, our analyst, in the flow of play. But as you well know, we'll have to wait and see exactly how that works on Saturday. And then it has a lot to do with how fast the two teams are going to play. But that's going to be our effort. Uh, we're going to try. We've cut it down to just a three-person traveling crew um, right now. Well, again, safe travels. We'll see you in, uh, in, in Boone Pickens Stadium on Saturday. And uh, that'll be interesting. I, Dave, we've talked a lot about this this summer, and I know you've been on calls with, with Dave and all the play-by-play -play guys in the, in the conference. You know, uh, in fact, I, I had Chris Budden on from ESPN earlier, and I mentioned to her that I think we're the only league where everybody is still traveling. I think most of the other leagues, there are teams that are keeping their whole broadcast crews remote at home. So yeah. um, safe travels, and we'll see you on Saturday. Robert, appreciate the time. Look forward to seeing you. All right, thanks, Tony. I appreciate you guys. Thanks. You bet. All right, Tony Caridi, voice of the West Virginia Mountaineers.